Happy Aloha Friday, and welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. So much is going on around the globe this week. As America celebrated 4th of July, violence and conflicts in the Middle East and North Africa have put in jeopardy the health of 24 million children in Yemen, Syria, and Gaza Strip, Iraq, Libya, and Sudan. Damage to health infrastructure is depriving children of essential health care, water and sanitation services have been compromised, causing waterborne diseases to spread while preventative health care and nutritious food are insufficient to, the, meet, to meet the needs of children. Uh, today, 20 of the world's largest economies are meeting in Hamburg, Germany, to discuss issues such as trade, immigration, and climate change, and President Trump is attending the meeting. A few minutes ago, we learned that Hawaii bids to narrow Trump's administration's travel ban was rejected. It appears that the United States Supreme Court is sending a very clear message, and it's putting its executive dis orders discriminatory policy back into effect, thus allowing the beginning of ethnic cleansing in the United States. States. We got issues in Aloha State as well. Today is a sad day for our state and for every organization that relies on state funding to provide free services to people who could not be able to afford to pay for legal costs because of our state legislature cut every penny for free or low cost legal services to Hawaiian residents in need of legal services. What that means for the state of Hawaii is that as of July 1st of 2018 fiscal year, no money will be allowed towards these services in the judiciary budget. And on that note, today's program will deal with uplifting news, which is the democratic state of our state. We have a special guest, Josh Frost, president of Pono Hawaii Initiative with us. We will examine the current status of Hawaiian democratic structure and talk about Pono Hawaii Initiative's mission and vision, which is quite refreshing and needed not only in our state, but also all over the United States. We need venues and organizations who are committed to empower and support people-driven leadership for quality public policy and political engagement. And this is a wonderful organization that supports political, uh, and is part of the political organization of Hawaii Alliance of Progressive Action. Both organizations were founded by Gary Holzer. Uh, Josh, welcome to our program. Thank you. And uh, uh, to our viewers who do know who you are, do you mind telling us a little bit about your background? Where do you come from? How did you end up in Hawaii? Ah, <laughs> ah it's a, uh, I'll give you the short version. So I moved to Hawaii about uh, almost 15 years ago, uh, sort of on a whim, just to try to, you know, figure out the direction of my life, and I ended up staying. I fell in love with the place and the people and the culture and the weather. Um, Where did and, you move from? Uh, well, I grew up in Kansas. So about as opposite from Hawaii. Kansas <laughs> I think to Hawaii. Yes, yes. Uh, and so, like I said, so I've been out here for about 15 years mm -hmm. and got involved in local politics about 2006. Mm. And what prompted you to get involved with the local politics? Um, well, I had started to get an interest in politics generally. I watched the... Uh, uh, 2004 election. I did a little bit of work with the Democratic Party um, in 2004, and <clears throat> just wasn't really excited. So I sort of took a couple years off, trying to figure out my path. And in 2006, I met some people, uh, former uh, fellow progressives, who were starting a new organization, and it was right up my alley. And I helped them. I joined them, and, and we formed uh, uh, Progressive Democrats of Hawaii. Uh, which was one of the, the first sort of progressive organizations that was working inside and outside the Democratic Party to try and move the party in a more progressive direction. Uh, since then, I uh, am a co-founder of Equality Hawaii, which uh, you know worked for our civil unions and marriage equality. Um, I'm an officer in the Democratic Party. Uh, I work at the Capitol, and now I've, with Gary, have, have started Pono Hawaii Initiative. So let's talk about Pono Hawaii Initiative. Um, so I know it's the sister uh, organization of HAPA, and uh, so Pono Hawaii Initiative was funded when? It's, it's a recent... Uh, so we started, well, Gary and I and, and some others have been talking about doing this sort of uh, organization for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, we officially sort of 
you know, filed paperwork and, and became a C4 just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're just now getting started. We held an event, uh, a launch event on Oahu here uh, a couple weeks ago. And actually this weekend we're going to be holding uh, uh, an event on Kauai. So do you mind telling our viewers um, about the mission and uh, the vision of Pono Hawaii initiatives? Yeah. Uh, so what we want to do is we, we want to develop relationships within um, the community here and on the rest of the islands and, and really work with folks already on the ground, activists, people who are already active in their community on issues and, and elections, and start to or continue the work that they've done and expand it in such a way as, as we can build or grow a movement. Right. So, in, and we're looking to do that in a couple of different ways. One is uh, in the ballot, uh, you know, in the voting booth. We want to, there are legislators at the state level and county levels who just aren't serving the needs of the people. And we believe that it's, it's time to, to change that. So we'll be looking at elections, um, supporting candidates uh, next year. Uh, who are progressive, who have the best interests of, of Hawaii and the people of Hawaii um, at heart, and who are principled and, and we think are, are strong enough to stand up against the incredible pressures that exist inside uh, the legislature or the county councils. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing we're going to be working on is ballot initiatives. Um, taking an issue that hasn't gotten traction or that uh, politicians haven't done enough uh, progress on. So you can think about, uh, you know, housing, uh, affordable housing, homelessness, uh, environmental issues, economic justice issues, uh, and, and take it directly to the people, right? So the, the easiest example to understand, although um, the law doesn't allow us to do it, would be a $15 minimum wage. The legislature has failed to, to do that, um, not really moving a bill this year. And so basically putting it to the people, would you support a $15 minimum wage? Now, like I said, the, the law doesn't allow for that, but we can look at potentially uh, zoning issues, um, defining what affordable really is at the county level, um, and then putting that to the people and letting them vote on it, rather than giving it to politicians who are uh, you know, paid for by lobbyists or the, you know, building trades or whatever. So it sounds like it's a venue to empower uh, local residents who are engaged, but those who may need that support through a little bit more of that training with civic engagement, but also information uh, to become more active in uh, support to have more of a voice in that democratic process that we are supposed to have, right? Right, right, exactly. So, uh, you know, we want to work with people who are already engaged, mm -hmm. but we also want to empower people who, you know, either just don't understand the system or haven't been involved before or, or just they're just hopeless. Like, why should I bother? and really bring those people into the discussion. So help our viewers understand, uh, it sounds like there are a couple of different things that you'll be focusing on with regards to the grassroots uh, build-up and empowerment development. So one with public officers uh, you know, who are interested in becoming part of the legislature right. uh, process but also the public at large. So what is the vision to support uh, the, the two constituencies, you know, the two groups? Well, so they're, they're really, they're sort of over, overlapping or parallel mm. tracks, right? We want to, uh, people who might not care for electoral politics and, and want to work on issues, uh, you know, doing the ballot initiative or working on issues at the county level or state level, will be developing uh, you know, and growing a movement to help on on that front. And but parallel to that is is finding and supporting candidates for public office who share our vision, who share our our, uh, our values, mm -hmm. right? So people who will be strong advocates for truly affordable uh, housing, right? People who will truly be supportive of a fifteen dollar minimum wage. People who really will push for local food production, right, and regulation of pesticides, and, and all of those things that our politicians 
for what, whatever their motivation, have been unwilling or unable to move the ball forward on those issues. Mm -hmm. So we want to empower the community, and we want to bring new blood into the that Function process. Well. Yes. Right. And how um, how is, do you view um, the build up of the accountability? of uh, this new chapter, perhaps, of Hawaiian uh, political arena. Because, uh, you know, we do have current politicians who, when they started in their journey, uh, they were very adamant and, and had a commitment with their constituents that they sure. would support, for example, living wages and affordable housing. And things didn't all happen the way that right. the promises were made. And it seems like year after year, um, there is more and more uh, dissatisfaction from the public who will go through the trouble of uh, writing testimonies, uh, supporting certain measures, and public, uh, pr private interests or lobbyists or all the decision-making factors take a uh, higher uh, priority and then um, things go sour and the voice of the people are not really heard or their interests. So right. what changes with uh, Pono Hawaiian, the Hawaiian initiative? Right. Well, so it's true the the, you know, again, at both the county and the state level, the, the system is, is designed such that you have to work within a structure, right? And and there's a certain amount of trading, and there's a certain amount of compromise that, that takes place, and it has to, right? In a democracy, there are opposing views, and we have to work together. The, I think the, the problem is, 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 one, I think a lot of the public has just sort of given up, right? They don't see the point in voting, they don't see the point in engaging, because more often than not, I think they feel on the losing end of an issue. And so they've just checked out, right? We have one of the lowest voter turnouts in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, one, and, and try to reinvigorate people and re-engage people in the process. Give them hope. Give, let, them, let them know that there are people who are really trying to, to serve their interests and then bring them along and try to get them engaged directly, right? Whether, whether it's testifying, whether it's calling and writing legislators, whether it's campaigning, whatever it is. And then, two, it's it's finding and supporting candidates who <clears throat> who will be able to sort of withstand the incredible pressures that exist inside the building, mm -hmm. right? And and the way we do that is is finding people who we feel have strong conviction and strong moral character to begin with, but then as if they get elected, then continue to support them, continue to give them strength so that they don't feel like they're in it alone, right? Mm -hmm. So when they take a strong position inside the legislature or the county council, they know that there are going to be people outside who have their back, who will support them, who will thank them for, for taking that position. Mm -hmm. And I think if more people did that now, we'd have more legislators and more elected officials who are willing to stand up. Mm -hmm. And so helping raise the the public debate and engaging the public in the process is part of what we're going to be trying to do. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really wonderful uh, that there is this need, but also a venue, you know, to uh, make it happen. So in many ways, Pono Hawaii Initiative is a bridge, yeah. a builder in many ways. And uh, also, what kind of um, support are you providing in terms of training uh, to people who are interested in becoming public officers uh, in the state of Hawaii. Okay. Uh, well, so Pono Hawaii Initiative won't really be involved in training, but as you say, the the are sort of they're not the two organizations aren't um, related, but they sort of are working on parallel tracks. You've got Pono Hawaii Initiative that'll work on elections and lobbying, and then you have. Uh, Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action, HAPA, which has been around a few years now, that is working on, uh, is, it's a C3, so it's educational. So mm -hmm. they, through their Kuleana Academy, which is designed to identify potential candidates and give them the tools and skills and resources to run effective campaigns, um, that training program, you know, I came out of it 
earlier this year. There's a whole group that came out last year, and, and Hoppe is gearing up to have a class again this fall. So we'll be looking at, at people who participate in, in the academy and to see not only where there are people who might want to run for office, but where there may be people who can be supportive, right? So we don't just need candidates. We need people who are campaign managers, who can help with fundraising, who can help organize volunteers, right? We need that infrastructure to support candidates who are running, because you can't do it by yourself. Exactly, it's a team effort. So we're going to take a quick break, okay. and when we come back, we're going to continue uh, with this conversation. And Excellent. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch. Hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff. MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice, um, Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Contamo, and I'm back with George Frost of uh, um, Poro Hawaii Initiative. So we were talking about um, how HAPA and uh, uh, Poro Hawaii Initiative work uh, in a separate but interdependent way to build up the education and the um, infrastructure, the foundation to support uh, a public officer, but also uh, those who want to support uh, uh, someone in that position. And then once you know, they got that foundation, they can come to uh, Puno Hawaii Initiative and say, all right, I'm ready to go. Yes. Yeah, yeah so we will, um, I don't know the timeline exactly, but we will be establishing a process mm -hmm to endorse candidates. And those candidates um, will hopefully get money from us, uh, but equally as important, they'll get support. So our, our goal is, is really to help them with staffing, help them with volunteers, um, and just overall in their communities try to get people out to support them. Um, and uh, like I said, the, the timeline is, is still a little fuzzy uh, but I'm hoping by early next year we will have a better idea of, you know, where what races we're going to be mm -hmm. getting involved in and who the candidates uh, mm -hmm. that we're going to support will be. So for the fall, uh, he told me that there may be a new Kuliana Academy class yes. uh, in place. And, and, and the students are not coming just from the island of Oahu. It's from all of the other islands? Is it, it is. And, uh, it's a it's a non-partisan program, mm -hmm. right? So they they're looking for people from different islands, from different backgrounds, dif different ethnicities, um, different um, points along the political ideological spectrum, and and really bring them all together to learn together, to share ideas together, and learn from each other. Do you mind sharing a little bit of your experience as a recent graduate of the Kuliana sure. Academy? Like, I know that you were working with public policy for a few years already before you started in the program. So what did Kuliana Academy provide you in terms of uh, additional foundational skills? It will with the points that you feel were cemented already, you know, and reinforced from what you already knew. Yeah. Um, I, at the time that I applied and, and went through the program, I thought that I might want to run for public office. And so, uh, even though I've done some organizing on issues, um, and I've worked on campaigns, I, I felt like I needed additional skills um, as far as, I, as far as fundraising, which I've never had to really do before. Um, uh, and then 
using social media and um, and networking and that sort of thing, those are all things that I felt like I needed improvement on. Mm -hmm. And Kuliana helped with some of that public speaking, talking to the media. Uh, but it covers the gamut. I mean, it, it, what you need to do to run a successful campaign, how to fundraise, um, how to develop maps to walk your district to knock on doors. Uh, the program provides uh, educational resources for all of that stuff, as well as just sort of general leadership training. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was, for me, it was really useful for, for fundraising and, and some media training and things like that. Um, but because I worked on campaigns and because I'd done issue uh, organizing before, a lot of the skills that Kuliana gives to people, I, I sort of already had the foundational um, experience. Uh, but it's also good because there, there are people from, from Maui County, from Kauai, from the Big Island, who I got to know really well, who otherwise I might not have ever met. And for me, it was an excellent networking opportunity, get to know people. And, and I'm going to Kauai this weekend, and I'll see some of them. When we go to Maui, I'll definitely be seeing some of those people um, from the Big Island, um, too. So I would say anyone who thinks they might want to run for public office, but also thinks, I don't, maybe I don't want to be uh, a candidate, but I want to be a campaign manager. Mm -hmm. And I want to be a supporter, a supporter, because we definitely need that infrastructure, too. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it was helpful. Uh, because I, it, through the course of the program, I realized that I don't really want to run for public office. That's not where my strengths are. But organizing and helping other candidates run for office is really where I can be the most good, too. right? So yeah. I sort of set aside that uh, ambition and really am focusing on now with Pono Hawaii Initiative. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to do that on a larger scale and, and being the support to numerous candidates across the state. Mm -hmm. That's great. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of the hard policy um, priorities that the Ponu Hawaii Initiative hopes to uh, bring to fruition or to help reframe the narrative and uh, sure. uh, the, the structure in the upcoming years for the state of Hawaii. Okay, yeah, um, the, the one that immediately comes to mind um, is $15 minimum wage. And partly because it's, it's been on the national stage, it was a major uh, issue during the presidential election. And this past legislative session, there was some effort to try to get a $15 uh, wage law passed. Mm -hmm. It didn't get very far this year. Uh, but what happened there? Like, um, how it, did the bill got uh, skipped? <coughs> If you recall, <laughs> yeah. Well, there. I mean, th there's lots of potential reasons, and and I think two. Well, there's, so there's a couple that I think are easiest to, to lay out. One, Hawaii. The legislature passed an increase in the minimum wage in 2014, mm -hmm. and it was set to go to 1010 by January 1, 2018. So the last time the legislature passed an increase, it had that that increase hasn't even but reached its limit yet, and yeah. so the the legislature this year said, well, we're still not where we said we were going to be when we passed the last one, so come back later, basically. Mm -hmm. And we kind of knew that that was going to be the outcome. We did get one hearing, two hearings on um, minimum wage bills, which was good. So at least we could get people to come and testify and, and start that conversation. But we knew it was going to be a multi-year process, because mm -hmm. that's just how it is. Um, the folks that were involved last year are coming together again, starting to plan for the next session, um, and really hope to push in 2018 a, a $15 minimum wage bill. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the only, I mean, the, it, it's, that one's good because it's easy to understand and it has sort of overwhelming support. Mm -hmm. But there are other economic justice issues um, you know, the state has, uh, advocates have been working on a paid leave bill, paid family leave bill mm -hmm. for, I couldn't even tell you how long. Um, and they continue to struggle to get something passed. And so we will we'll be working with, uh, you know, community advocates and, and partners to push forward a, a really good, or just, just something mediocre even, just to get the process started on, 
paid family leave, paid sick leave, uh, so that right now if, if you have a kid and they get sick, the law doesn't provide a lot of support for you if you've got to go home and take care of your kid. Mm. You know, it's, it's left up to the employer. Um, if you yourself get sick, a lot of employers don't I provide do. separate sick leave from your vacation, right? So maybe you get a vacation, but it's also, if you get sick, well, there goes your vacation time, mm. right? And so we want to, especially people who are working two jobs or working minimum wage, if they lose a week of work because they got to take care of their kid or they got to, you know, they're sick themselves, they that's the difference between being in a house and being on the street. And we need to work to change that. Absolutely. On, the, on that note, uh, you know, one of the biggest issues that Hawaii has, um, we're the state with the most uh, homeless student per capita in the yes. nation. And affordable housing is really definitely a big concern, a big issue. I think we're short in like 23,000 homes. It's, it's a ridiculous uh, number, yeah. So, um, is this an area that uh, candidates in the Pono Hawaii initiative you know, is committed to work with? Absolutely. Yeah. I, the affordable housing is, uh, is far more complicated because uh, there's so much to consider, right? You, if you've got to be able to build, right, which means you need construction companies that are willing to do it. Um, but then there's also the Hawaii market, which is just really expensive. So finding creative solutions um, that provide truly affordable housing, not the affordable housing that the county is providing, which is not like I, I do okay, but I couldn't afford my own place now. I rent, mm -hmm. right? Um, but so people making minimum wage, you know, certainly even at 1010, you know, won't be able to afford their own place. Mm -hmm. So finding yeah, creative and, uh, solutions and I'm, is I'm important. I'm really mentioning not even the ability to purchase your home or apartment unit. It's really the ability to rent uh, or maintain uh, an off income or why. Yeah. Not only the income, but the, you know, the, the percentage of what affordable housing would allow in different states so that you can have access to housing because I think that's one of the things we like here. Not sure. only it's the units, but also the structure and the availability for people to be able to you know, be able to actually even have a, a, a place to move in. I mean, 43% of people who are homeless in the state of Hawaii have a job. Yeah. And so it's not like, you know, there's not generation of income. It's just it's not enough it's money. It's not enough, right. And so, so finding creative solutions, um, I, I, I don't believe that there's one answer. I don't believe that there's a quick fix. It, it will require working with developers. It will require working with uh, you know, po uh, po elected officials mm -hmm. to, to come up with different ways uh, to address the issue. Yes. And the ballot initiative is one way that we're going to look to do that, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, to, to set the um, definition of what affordable is, mm -hmm. to set aside zoning so that this is only for rental affordable housing, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Well, that's exciting, you know, that uh, the conversations will happen and hopefully a team of people to be able to support move and shake in you know, the current status quo. On that note, I can't believe how quickly our I show ended, <laughs> but I hope that this may be, you know, the first of many visits that you will make sure. uh, to our program so that we can continue to keep up with uh, uh, news uh, from your neck of the woods and learn how the candidates are doing and uh, how the program is doing, how uh, our viewers can support and be engaged as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And uh, on that note, uh, that concludes uh, our program for today. And uh, um, we're very grateful for opportunities and uh, for the vision and the passion and the mission of uh, individuals that come together and organize you know, for a new and brighter uh, chapter of our Hawaiian democratic uh, process. Um, until next Friday, uh, we hope.